Um, hi and welcome. My name is Leona and on behalf of everyone here at Better Red Than Dead, we are so pleased to see you on Zoom to celebrate Sarah Sentel's latest release, Stranger Care, a memoir of loving what isn't ours. Sarah is joined in conversation by Charlotte Wood. Um, before we begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet. These will be different depending on where you're zooming in from. For me, it is the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that Better Red Than Dead is built. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Now, I'll quickly introduce uh, Charlotte and Charlotte will then take over and start the chat with Sarah. So Charlotte Wood is the author of six novels and two books of nonfiction. Her latest novel is the Inter international bestseller, The Weekend, which was the ABIA Literary Foundation Book of the Year for 2020, was shortlisted for the Stella Prize, uh, the Prime Minister's Literary Award and the ALS Gold Medal and the Christina Said Prize for Fiction. Her previous novel was also highly, highly regarded with many awards and her nonfiction work includes The Luminous Solution, The Writer's Room, Lo and Love and Hunger. Her features and essays have appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Literary Hub, Sydney Morning Herald, and The Saturday Paper, among many other publications. Um, before we begin, just one last bit of Zoom housekeeping. You'll notice that there's a mute or unmute option on the lower left corner of your screen. Um, we ask that you please keep yourself on mute just to prevent feedback and background noise from disrupting the proceedings. Um, when we move to the Q&A, please type your questions into the group chat and Sarah and Charlotte will answer them via video. And you can and should buy a copy of Stranger Care in store um, or on our website. It's front and centre on our homepage. Uh, without further ado, here are Sarah and Charlotte. Thank you so much, Leon. Um, hello, everybody. It's really wonderful for me to be here tonight with, for this conversation with Sarah Centillis. I too am speaking from the tra traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'm particularly speaking from Bulanaming, otherwise known as the Marrickville area of Sydney. So I pay my respects to the Gadigal and Bulanaming elders of the past and the present. And I especially welcome any First Nations people joining us tonight from wherever you may be. Sarah Centillis is a writer, teacher, critical theorist, scholar of religion, and the author of many books, including the most astoundingly good Draw Your Weapons, which won the 2018 Penn Award for Creative Nonfiction. Sarah's writing has appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, Oprah Magazine, The Los Angeles Review of Books, among many, many other publications. She has degrees from Yale and Harvard, and she is the co-founder of the Alliance of Idaho, which works to protect the human rights of immigrants. Now, Sarah and I first met when she came to Australia a couple of years ago to talk about Draw Your Weapons. I had actually seen her speak in uh, New Zealand, and when I knew she was coming here, I kind of wangled away of meeting her, and we have stayed in touch since then and become friends, I would like to think. Uh, as well as being an outstanding writer, Sarah is a very inspiring teacher and mentor to writers and artists of all kinds. And I can personally very highly recommend her workshops and courses to any artist who might be joining us tonight. Sarah lives and works in Idaho in the USA. Tonight, as you know, we're here to talk about stranger care. I have sadly bent the cover, which I'm ashamed of. Um, Stranger Care, a memoir of loving what isn't ours. This is a devastating memoir of about foster care and adoption in America. And it's really about a whole lot, uh, much more broad and deep questions about family, about parenting and about community. Sarah is joining us from Idaho where it is the ungodly hour of four o'clock in the goddamn morning. <laughs> So we are even more grateful to have Sarah with us tonight. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for getting up so early. So well, nice to see I, you. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And thank you, Leona, for making this happen. Um, now, many people here may have heard you as I did today. I think it was actually uh, first broadcast yesterday, but repeated today the 
um, conversation on ABC Conversations with Sarah Konofsky, fantastic long chat about the book. Uh, but in case people have, haven't heard that or don't know anything about it, Sarah, can you just talk in a nutshell about what is Stranger Care about and why did you need to write it? Um, I would love to, and I should acknowledge where I am. I'm, I'm in Idaho on Shoshone Bannock land. Um, and I love that you all acknowledge country at the beginning of things. In the United States, we don't acknowledge that this is stolen land and we don't acknowledge enslavement of people. We don't acknowledge any of our past history. So um, thank you for doing that. So uh, Stranger Care, I wrote Stranger Care as a love letter to our foster daughter, Coco. I wrote it as a book um, that I hoped would mother her when I was no longer allowed to mother her. Um, and the title Stranger Care comes from what uh, my partner Eric and I were called in the foster care system. So we were what's known as non-relative care providers or stranger care, which is such an alienating, <laughs> horrible term for this very intimate task of taking care of other people's children, um, of parenting them. You know, a lot of times foster care is thought of as babysitting, but it's really parenting. You know, we had a an infant, a three-day-old infant that we brought home, which meant we were feeding her every two hours. We were we were the ones introducing her to food. We were the people rocking her to sleep. You know, she was with us for quite some time. So um, I wanted to explore that term, both it's the way it made me feel alienated and isolated, um, and also the fact that um, taking care of strangers is I think the ultimate ethical obligation that we all have. It's if anything, a one command shared by all religions, care for the stranger. Um, and I wanted to explore in the natural world too, how the natural world takes care of um, the beings that we share this planet with. So that's what it's about. And it is an amazing, um, I hate to use the word journey, but it is, there is a real, you know, it's, it's a kind of page turner in the most heartrending way because this is your life and Coco's life that we're talking about. I want to just go back to the beginning um, about the choice to have a child or not have a child in the first place, you know, a biological child, I guess. Uh, the choice to have a child has always struck me as a fundamentally hopeful and optimistic act. And sometimes I wonder if my own choice not to have children uh, sort of reveals something about my own optimism or pessimism, maybe more likely of the human race. Um, and that, pessimism or maybe realism that I have is I think something that your husband Eric has shared um, with me so is this collision of optimism and pessimism was that the cause of your eventual decision to foster a child rather than have a biological child of your own um, Eric, well, Eric calls himself a disappointed I idealist, uh, but we once saw this cartoon that was three glasses of water half filled, and the first one is like, I'm half full, and the second one is, I'm half empty, and the third one is, I think it's piss. <laughs> and, um, I'm definitely the half full person in our marriage, and Eric's definitely the I think it's piss uh, person in our marriage, but um this decision of, of about whether or not to have a biological child revealed so much. You know, I, I think of myself as a radical feminist um, who is strong and, and you know, taking the world by storm. Uh, but it turned out I hadn't really been admitting to myself my own longings for a child and I hadn't been admitting them to my partner either. And by the time I admitted that I wanted to be a mother, it turned out I was married to um, a, an environmentalist who didn't want to bring another human into the world, wanted to instead take care of the children who already needed homes. In the United States, there's 500,000 kids in the foster care system, half a million children in the foster care system. Um, and then the, so we had to figure out what to do. You know, Eric wants to live in a world where we tend the earth and I wanna live in a world where we tend one another. And so foster care became our shared common ground. You know, I, I, around and around I went, do I wanna have a baby? Do I wanna have a baby? Do I wanna have a baby? And then the question shifted, do I wanna be a parent? Um, which is a very different question. And I realized I didn't need to be pregnant. I didn't need to give birth. I just wanted to be a mother. Um, so we found some common ground in the foster care system. And we also have this other rift running through our marriage, which is 
um, both of us think the world is made and can be unmade and remade. And we both think that humans are responsible for this state of affairs that we find ourselves in with climate change and uh, racial injustice and all the kinds of oppressions that we live with. Um, and I think that humans have everything we need to live differently and that we could make a new world. And I, I want to hope that we might. Eric thinks that we won't. Um, and so this is how we try to, we have to navigate um, what it means to live in this world. Um, but we both are activated by social justice and we both want to help, um, help take care of, of pe people and animals and the earth that's in pain. So foster care enabled us to do that and to find this common space. Mm. Well, you know, for two people who have such a kind of um, really powerfully ethical framework for everything you do in your lives, it seems to me, um, what actually happened through the course of this fostering took you to some pretty difficult places, right? It really challenged some of those ideals, which um, is, is always good to have one's, you know, ideals tested and challenged, but this was really testing for you. There's so much to talk about in the book, and I do want to talk about, you know, what happens, what happened with you and Coco, but I also want to talk about the writing process of this book, because I think probably a lot of the coverage of Stranger Care will really focus on the content, for want of a better word, your life. Um, but, but, you know, the making of a book is, is part of your life, a huge part of your life. So I do want to get onto that soon. But let's talk about the foster care system in Idaho because this book is a pretty excoriating look at, at that system. And I, I found it really so distressing to understand how cumulatively abusive, really just bureaucracy on its own can be. It, it was chaotic, it was disorganized often seemingly very random in the decision-making processes. You know, there were things, dates were changed all the time, paperwork went missing. There were kind of ludicrous things that happened, like one of the workers who's telling you, you're standing in a hallway waiting to meet Evelyn, the mother, a Coco, the biological mother, and a, and a worker says, well, that's your woman there. And she's not Evelyn. And she knows she's not Evelyn. You know she's not Evelyn, but the woman behind the desk is saying, yes, I've got these two bits of paper, so there you are, they're matched up. It just seemed kind of Kafka-esque and, and um, you know, I just don't know how, it, it was a real insight into how people whose lives are so regulated by bureaucracy and services and governments just have to live with this bureaucratic torture their whole lives so what is what is my question can you just take us through some of the steps that were required to get approved for starters as foster parents um yes yeah, so i eric and i were living in um, oregon when we decided that we wanted to be foster parents so we started the certification process there uh which meant that we had two social workers who visited our house regularly and asked us questions um, everything from our past sexual histories to our relationship with alcohol to our politics to religion to our parenting styles to whether we would hit our kids. I mean, it just ranged everything and it was completely invasive. And when I would complain about it, Eric would say, but they're trusting us with a child. Like, don't you think this should be invasive? Um, but really when it came down to it, all they cared about was whether we had carbon monoxide detectors and fire extinguishers, that's really all that mattered. Um, but this, this process really brought out my kind of good girl performing self, um, which made me act like a complete freak in these meetings. I was like so weird, you know, I would make cookies and tea and try to, because I thought that these people could determine whether or not I could become a parent. Eric was much more savvy about it and he was just charming and made jokes and they loved him. They thought I was so weird and they loved him. And they would also split us up. So they would ask me questions upstairs and Eric questions downstairs. And I was always like sweating through mine, you know, being interrogated. The, the woman who was asking questions was really interrogating me and did not interrogate Eric. Um, I think there were different expectations for the mother than for the mm. potential foster 
father. So I'd hear, I would be like sweating and crying and then hear him come laughing up the stairs, you know, um, having had his conversation. But um, when I we love this. Out, oh, go ahead. I want to, sorry to interrupt you there, but in, in that particular instance, so, you know, Sarah's there being the good girl and trying to work out what they want her to say and, you know, working out the, the best possible nice person response and then Eric's laughing and chatting and and they're having a great time the other two and then um you say to Eric I want your social worker next time because I had the mean one and he's he's sort of very strategic about in his approach to this right so he he said look the questions are irrelevant they're just trying to work they're just trying to see if you're getting if you're going to get upset and look you're getting upset so he's this kind of voice of really rational reason through the whole thing in in a time when there's no way I would have been able to hold on to any form of reason myself no yeah I I was like an insane person through that I I I really struggled with um with that process like that we had to fill out this 50 page questionnaire about our lives and then my social worker would have it and she'd have different parts highlighted and I was like are the highlightings good are the highlightings bad I remember at one point she said um did your did your parents hit you and I, I said no and she said well you know your mom had four young kids and she gave up her career I I would have hit you I was like well she didn't she didn't hit me and then she said well why have you been in therapy for so long and I said, well, I think everyone should be in therapy. And then she wrote something down. And I was like, what is she writing down? You know, is that, is that good or bad? Um, but when we moved to Idaho, we had to start all over again. So that's one of the problems with the foster care system is it's different from state to state to state. So nothing we had done. We had done about a year of preparation and classes and social worker visits. Everything had to be started from scratch in Idaho, which in a way I welcomed because I wanted a do-over. I had been so very weird <laughs> through the Idaho, uh, through the Oregon process that I was welcoming a do-over. But um, the experience here was was wildly different and not quite as invasive. Um, they, they just came once. They asked a couple questions. Then they came back to make sure we had fire detectors and a, a fire ladder. And then they approved us to be foster parents. Yeah, and then it then it happens like that, right? So you have this eternal process of, you know, can you get to the meeting? Can you get approved? Can you go to the course? And then it's cancelled, and then they give you a different date, and then you have to start again. Blah blah blah. This goes on for ages, and then suddenly, we have a baby for you. You need to come and get her now. Mm-hmm. So tell us about when the day that you got the call about Coco. Um, I was I was working with a writing client actually, and <clears throat> I had a call came through my cell phone, which I ignored, and our landline rang, and I ignored that too. And then Eric came to the my office door, which is glass, and I I I get really annoyed when he interrupts me when I'm on the phone with someone, and I was like I pointed to my headset like I'm busy, I'm talking with the client, and he had this really weird look on his face, so I. I texted him, I, he had an aunt who was sick and I was worried maybe something had happened. So I texted him like, is everything okay? And he wrote back, um, baby. And I was, I wrote back when, and he said now. Um, so I got off the phone with my client and we, I listened to all the messages on my phone and it was a, a social worker telling us that there was a three day old baby girl and asking if we could come to get her. And that was at 11 a.m. Um, and we had to drive two hours to go get her. And by, excuse me, by 2 a.m., I'm 2 p.m. Uh, that afternoon, we had a baby. We had a baby girl, and I'll never forget the first time I saw her. She was um, under five pounds, and um, a nurse was holding her and feeding her, and um, the connection that Eric and I felt for her was just immediate and, and fierce, and um, we had underestimated that, uh, what it would feel like um, to welcome a stranger into your home and how how deep that connection would be and how quickly it would come. Um, and then we also underestimated what it would feel like to be asked to give her back um, and to be asked to give her back to someone that we didn't think was safe. Um, so that was the beginning of our, of our experience with Coco. And it's such, I mean, you know, I, I have a lot of very good um, left-wing ideals about you know, supporting people who who are not equipped to be good parents and all of that. And and all of the time I was reading this, I was just like, get that baby and 
do not <laughs> let her go, you know. And, of course, there are so many really, really complicated um, issues at play. One of the things I want to ask you about is the kind of magical thinking that goes on in this mm-hmm. scenario where I think there's a magical thinking that goes on when when anyone has a child in their care whether it's their own birth child or not, that everything's going to be all right, right? We, we can't ever predict what will happen. But tell me how you managed to sh- kind of shut out, I think, of the words you use, the fact that 67% of foster kids will go back to their biological family. So you knew that and you sort of didn't want to know that at the same time because you were, you were fostering with a view to adoption, right? Yes, Um, Well, you know, Eric always says denial is the fifth force of the universe. It's like a very, very strong um, force. And I was in pretty deep denial about what the system was set up to do. Um, And I I imagined myself like an ostrich with my head buried in the sand. But I realized I didn't even understand what ostriches are doing. I don't know if people know this, but they're actually tending eggs. They're like turning their eggs uh, in the in the sand. We've been told that they're hiding. (laughs) They're hiding or they think if you can't if they can't see you, you can't see them. But actually they're they're parenting. (laughs) Um, which seems like a fitting thing to mistake. Uh, But, you know, we had tried our best. We we made it clear we wanted to adopt through the foster care system. And when they called us about Coco, we asked a lot of questions and we were told that um, her mother, who I call Evelyn in the book, was what they call a poor prognosis, which is another alienating term, that that there was no way she could get her life together and that the chances of us adopting Coco were very high. Um, so that is what part of why we brought her home is we thought that we would get she would be our, a, a child that we could keep. Um, but it slowly became clear that that was not their intention at all um, and that all of the supports are designed to reunify children with their um, biological parents. And in Idaho, the statistics are actually 72 percent of the time they're reunified. In the rest of the country, it's about 50 percent. Um, And what's crazy about it is that during the time that Coco was in our care, Evelyn was wrapped with supports. I mean, she had tons of support. She had uh, access to rehab. She had a a counselor. She had mental health services. She had social worker. She had a court appointed special advocate. She had um, housing help. She had help with her finances. She had job training. She had this huge network of support because that's the point um, is to protect the biological parents constitutional right to parent and to help them prepare to welcome their child back home. But then when Coco was reunified with Evelyn, all of those supports disappeared. Evelyn that was, was left so completely shocking on her to me own. That, that just at the point where, and we're sort of skipping ahead here a little bit, just at the point where Evelyn takes this baby home on her own full time, that's the point at which all the support vanishes. It just seems so insane. It's mind blowing. And it's it's a very underfunded, under-resourced system, you know, mm-hmm. that is trying to pick up the pieces of the rest of our failed systems, like poverty and racism and um, sexism and the fact that we don't have a pro-family uh, society here, pro-mother, definitely we don't have. Mm-hmm. Um, and the social workers, you know, they go in for the right reasons, I think, um, but they see the worst that we do to one another every day. That's their job. And so in some Mm -hmm. sense, they have to kind of shut down their hearts and shut down that part of themselves. And I just think a lot about how difficult that system was for me to navigate. I'm a white, overeducated woman with financial resources. Um, What is it like for the 500,000 children trapped in that system? And what is it like for poor parents and for parents of color Mm -hmm. to try to navigate? Um, So it's really, it was hard for me, but it's not about me. It's about these other, it's about these other people and and, um, the violence that the bureaucratic and actual violence that's done um, to them. There's one scene where you're in one of these sort of training meetings or sort of preparation um, courses, I guess, and, and, um, Eric and another guy in the class have a sort of disagreement about um, racism. And the, and the, the instructor says, okay, okay, um, one thing we have to make clear is that we don't talk about politics and we don't talk about religion here. Uh-huh. And I just thought, wow, so the two things that are responsible for the whole, you know, un- unwanted pregnancies all over the place and unwanted babies and the system that allows these people to be in such dire straits like Evelyn, but we can't talk about them. 
it was just sort of very again i mean and of course you can see why why you can't talk about that in those meetings because it would just be chaos right um but let's talk about um it is a really racialized um situation right i think maybe i've frozen Uh, so can you guys hear me? I think I've lost for a minute. Oh, good. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Sarah. So, you know, adoption and fostering is in general is an extremely racialized issue. And in this country, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of the incredible depths of sort of unhealed trauma, uh, ongoing trauma in Australia about the removal of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, generations of trauma that's um, happened here. And still now Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids are nearly 10 times more likely to be removed from their families than non-Indigenous children. So Sarah, what, what would you have done? Would you have um, accepted an African-American baby or a um, Native American child? How did you, what were your discussions about race and, and fostering and adoption? I think Sarah's vanished. Hmm. Sorry, everybody. Leonie, do you have any ideas about what we should do? Yeah, I'll try. I'll try sending her an email with the link again, just in case. I'm sure. Well, she she knows Zoom very well, so I'm sure she'll be trying to get back on if she can. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I'll say hello to a few people. Hi, Bronwyn and Jane Wilson and Michelle. Nice to see you. Oh, and Jane Briggs. Lots of people. I've got my view on the wrong, so I can't see everybody now. Maybe I'll duck out and see if she's emailing. Has anybody read Stranger Care yet? Oh, Jane Wilson has. Karen's got one in her hand. Maybe we should have a writing class now while we're waiting. I can go around and ask all the people I know who should be writing books right now <laughs> how it's going. Michelle. <laughs> uh, hmm. How are you going, Leona? Any progress? Yeah, I've reset the link to her. I can't see anything on our end, unfortunately. I might just see if I'm getting any emails from her myself. Hi. Oh. I got completely thrown You're off. Back. I don't know, my computer is not working and I, I got another computer. <laughs> okay. Well, good to have you back. You okay? Yes. Sorry about that. That was panic. Okay. I panicked. <laughs> well, I'm not surprised. Okay. Um, so I just went into a big thing about the um, racialization of adoption and, you know, that, that the, the fact in Australia is that um, the removal of children is a massive ongoing trauma for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And it was a, there are generations and generations of terrible trauma that is still being played out. And, First Nations kids in this country are still 10 times more likely to be removed from their families than non-Indigenous children. So what were your and Eric's kind of expectations or conversations around race and fostering and adoption? Because I know that it's, it's a racialized situation there as well, right? Yeah, 
Yes, it's um, there's tremendous racism in, in the foster care system. There was an article in the New York Times that called the foster care system the new, uh, the Jane Crow instead of the Jim Crow, and how um, Black parenting is criminalized um, in a way that white parenting isn't. Um, so, you know, it was in that, I think right before I got thrown out of the Zoom, you were talking about the fight that Eric got in with the uh, person in our class who was making all kinds of racist statements and Eric was trying to point out the structural racism. Um, so that that's part of the problem is being trapped in a system that is not only doing violence to everyone, but is doing a specific kind of racialized violence. And there's a long history of taking children away from Na Native Americans. And now um, there's black children are taken away from their parents at a much higher rate than white children and they aren't returned. Um, and they're more likely to be harmed by the system itself that is designed to protect them. So there's tremendous and ongoing structural and systemic racism in the foster care system in the US. Um, Evelyn is white and um, Coco is white. Um, tell us about how your relationship with Evelyn developed, changed, you know, it's such a kind of fraught thing. And at one point, you know, she, she says something like, um, I feel bad now, but soon you're going to feel bad because I'm going to get her back and you're going to lose her. So yeah. these very frank conversations between the two of you about what it meant to both of you to, 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 to gain and lose this baby. I'll, I'll never forget the first time that I met Evelyn. So we had, we picked up Coco from the hospital when she was three days old. And then um, we didn't meet Evelyn until two weeks later at the court, um, at the courthouse. And, um, she, you know, here she was, this woman who had given birth two weeks before, and her body still had the signs of, of birthing mm -hmm. a baby. And um, I had Coco in a stroller, and we went through the metal detector at the courthouse. And um, on the other side, Evelyn said, can, can I hold her? She wanted to hold her daughter. And uh, I said, of course, and handed her this, you know, under five pound baby and just watched Evelyn cradle her and say, whisper, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. That's all she said to her, um, which was my first sign like, okay, this is different than I understood it to be. Um, I I am not her mother. I'm not Coco's mother. I'm her foster mother. And, and this is her biological mother. And my relationship with Evelyn was the most challenging and horrifying and beautiful and profound relationships of my life. Um, I had, I wanted to keep her daughter. Um, and so I was not cheering for her. I was not hoping that she would be successful in doing the things that she'd need to do in order to get her daughter back. And I had a very challenging conversation with uh, my therapist, who's a brilliant goddess, who I love. Um, who she said, sounds amazing, um, I must say. She's amazing. Um, and she said, uh, basically, you have to turn this 180 degrees around. Um, you have to stop rooting. Uh, I can't say that in Australia. <laughs> you have to stop hoping that she fails and start hoping that she succeeds because um, she, here's this person who has had the most horrible life. She's demonstrating that she wants to make changes in her life so she can get her child back. And you have to support that. She said, if you do support that and she turns her life around, then you'll be sad, but you won't be bitter and mean. Um, and then she said, if she doesn't, you're going to be able to need to look into the eyes of your daughter and say, your mother was beautiful and she fought for you and we did everything to support her to do that. Um, and you'll be ha have to be telling, telling the truth. Um, at one point she said, um, you can't think your life is more valuable than Evelyn's. Mm -hmm. And um, here's a person who's whose life could be saved um, by this baby and, and you don't need your life saved. Um, so learning how to love Evelyn became a, a practice for me, a, a hard and difficult practice. Um, I had thought that the stranger that I was tasked to care for was Coco, um, but loving her was so easy. Um, really the stranger that I, I needed to learn how to care for was Evelyn. Mm. It's so profound and so tough and complicated. Um, I want to talk a bit about the writing now and um, in about 10 minutes I'll, I'll ask our, our audience if they want to ask some questions and I have so many more but 
I do want to move on to how you wrote this book because, and there's so much more about the the story. I hate even saying that when it's, you know, it's your life that we're talking about, but um, that, you know, you, you'll have to buy the book and read. There's so much com- more complexity than we can get to in this hour. But, you know, this is a book about Coco and you. It's also then a book about grief. When, when Coco leaves you, tell me what it was, you know, a lot of writers say they need a long distance between a, a, a grief-filled experience and the writing of that experience. But you were writing this book all the way through, it seems to me. And it was, was it a year ago that, that Coco left you? Yeah, about a year and a half ago. Right. June. So, mm-hmm. so you're publishing this book very close to the actual experience. Why... You know, why was it important to get it down now and to have this book in the world now rather than waiting 10 years or whatever? Mm. Uh, well, writing about her um, sa- save, saved my life. You know, I, I thought that I wasn't going to be able to survive the loss of, of Coco. And um, when we would have the most traumatic days or the most difficult days or the most helpless or rage-filled days, Eric would look at me and he'd say, uh, go write. And I was like, I can't. And he just said, go write, go write, go write. And so I would just sit at my computer or at my journal and write everything that was happening. And I'm so glad that I did because then I had this raw material to use. Um, and uh, Draw Your Weapons was such a difficult book to write. It did take me 10 years <laughs> to write this book, that book. Um, but Stranger Care was much easier because when I was writing, um, I felt a sense of agency that I didn't feel anywhere else in just arranging the words on the page. Mm-hmm. Um, even if those words are, she is gone, you know, she, she is gone. Um, and I also writing about Coco brought her close when she wasn't, I felt her close to me. And just even now being able to talk about her, it's difficult and emotional, but I feel her close to me when I talk about her. And I wanted this book to mother her. I wanted to, um, I didn't know where she was going to be. I didn't know if she was safe. And I wanted my writing to help create a world where she might be tended no matter where she was. Um, So I had some urgency about it. I wanted it to be in the world so that I could imagine her reading it someday. Um, And I could imagine her caretakers reading it someday so that they might might, um, take better care of her and that she might be safe. In the structure of the book, it's really interesting. It's written in quite short, pieces I don't know if I'll be able to um yeah so and each of them has a has a heading on the page uh almost like notebook entries but much more highly crafted obviously (laughs) and and, um beautified than that but but that seems to me to have a function about the kind of bearability of the material right for a reader so can you talk about the way you structured it and why you chose to do that um, yes. So, and thank you so much for asking me about the writing. You're right. That story is so dramatic that it sometimes takes over and I really love to talk about craft. So thank you, Charlotte. Um, I, I write in fragments. There's so many people here that I see that are in uh, writing workshops with me and I love myself a good fragment. <laughs> I also love juxtaposition. I love to bring things together that we're trained to think of as separate. Um, and to, I also love white space and, and page breaks because I think it leaves room for the reader and room for breath um, and room for the reader to animate the text and draw her own conclusions from it. Um, I knew that this was going to be a super intimate personal story um, and I also wanted to open it out to the wider world. Um, So it moves between this very uh, personal story about Coco and me and Eric um, to the the natural world and um, parenting and mothering and stranger care that happens there. So I wanted to kind of take the lens small in focus and then out wide and then in focus and then out wide. Um, and I also wanted to offer um, a respite for people um, from the difficult material. So when Coco was with us, I took her on a walk every day and I got to introduce her to the nat- natural world. Like this is the moon, this is snow, this is a maple tree, this is a mountain, this is a rock. And when she was gone, um, it was the natural world that held me in my grief. It was this mountain landscape where I live and where I hike and where I walk that allowed me to um, begin the healing process. Um, and so I wanted some of that medicine to be in the book as well. And what about um, some of the sort of ethical decisions around writing that you needed to make? I mean, anyone writing about 
the real world has, you know, um, anxieties and issues about when you're writing about other people, how much right do you have to tell what stuff about them, etc. So what were the kind of, did you have to draw sort of lines for yourself or boundaries or rules about what you would and wouldn't include? How did you negotiate that ethical terrain? Um, well, I, I changed all the names in the book, which is a first ethical thing. And I, I changed descriptions of, of people so that they wouldn't be identifiable. Um, I, you know, the, the book is a love letter to Coco, but it's also a love letter to Evelyn. I tried to be really generous on the page and with my prose towards her. Um, and that was, that was not hard uh, because I feel deep love for her, even though I think she's... Um, you know, left kind of a wake of destruction behind her. Um, the harder people for me to be generous to were the social workers. Um, and I wanted to write kind of a screed <laughs> against uh, what happened, but um, it was a good practice to um, not do that as well. That's tough because you are writing a critique of this system, right? That And, and some of this behavior is corrupt. I mean, it, it's, it's really, really, I would think borderline criminal stuff that goes on for some of those people. Yes, it is. And, but I wanted to, you know, it's like these under-resourced systems that are um, asked to pick up the rest of our failures. I wanted to more see it that um, all of these children in the foster care system belong to us. This broken system belongs to us. It we can't we can't just blame the system. We have to actually look at our own complicity. And so mm -hmm. that was part of part of what I was trying to get at. And I also um, think we should never be the hero of our own story. <laughs> so that's to me a real ethical um, thing about writing a memoir. I think there has to be almost that double view. Like these are the ways I super. Um, can I swear on this? Can I? Yes, of course you can. We're Australians like, here. You know, these are the ways I super fucked up. These are the kinds of thoughts that I was entertaining. I wanted something bad to happen to Evelyn. Um, and then have that that uh, other voice of myself where the prose kind of lifts it from that, um, that narrow view. And so I think that you can have almost like three layers in the text is one, uh, this raw honesty, um, which is also highly curated, but you know, truth, truth telling. Um, then yourself later who knows who can see the mistakes that you're making and knows better or hopefully knows better. And then the prose itself becomes kind of an ethical layer of the text. Like, what are you going to do to your reader? How are you going to lift them through this? What are you going to share? How are you going to offer relief? Um, I don't want to cause harm to my reader. So, so how do you, how do you navigate those questions? And um, part of the structure is a formal answer to those, those issues that I was wrestling with. Mm. It's beautiful, beautifully done. And, you know, and as someone who's written a very tough book myself, I understand that the fear of hurting your reader is a really, is a real ethical um, consideration that I think more writers should think about, you know. Um, what about voice? Did the voice just come really naturally to you or it, were there kind of decisions about voice? Obviously, the, the kind of stepping back from the material, as you say, you know, into observations from philosophy and religion and, and from nature, the natural world, um, they, they have this um, breathing effect that you talked about. It, it allows the reader to just go, oh, yes, I'm, I'm not in this story myself. <laughs> it's protective of the reader, I think, you know, in a really lovely way. But did those decisions just come naturally? How did you negotiate the voice decision? Uh, I had, voice is so interesting. Um, the voice came pretty, pretty easily to me. I'm, I'm a pretty spare, spare writer. <laughs> um, and the voice, the voice was clear to me. What was harder was um, uh, the generosity, uh, you know, to try to, as a discipline, to be a generous mm -hmm. writer. Um, one of the things that I think is important, and I talk about this in my workshops, is that um, the, that we can never fully capture another human being or another being or another object on the page, that our words will, will always fall short. And that's something that's deeply theological for me. You know, I studied theology and religion in graduate school. And the thing I like about 
the ideas about God is that the re remembering that our ideas about God always fall short. And I think that that's true for our ideas about other people as well. And so um, a formal question that I always wrestle with is how can I show that there's always more to this other person than what I can capture on the page? Um, and I really try to do that with Evelyn, um, with Coco, with the social workers, with myself, with my partner, um, to show that um, what I might be writing about them is fragmentary and that they transcend um, whatever kind of categories or boxes I'm putting them in. Um, so that was a really important thing for me to think through and to explore as a writer. Mm. I'm gonna to go to open up to questions in a second, but there, there, are, there are two epilogues um, in, in this story, one in the book, which is kind of pretty devastating epilogue about what happened after Coco left you. Um, and then there is another epilogue, which is about your life now and something kind of incredible that is news of about two weeks old. Mm -hmm. Do you want to share that briefly? Yes, I'm, I'm a mother again. I have a, um, an infant baby boy who's being fed by Eric in the other room as I talk with you. Um, we worked with an adoption agency, a nonprofit, very ethical adoption agency in Idaho, and we matched with this extraordinary birth mother um, about six weeks ago, and she gave birth on April 19th, and we, we went to the hospital and we picked up our son, and it's an open adoption. So he will always know his birth mother and his birth mother's family. And um, she is the most generous, open-hearted, kind, funny, incredible person. And um, now we have a, a two, two and a little bit week old baby um, here. So book and baby at same time, <laughs> which is why getting up at 4 a.m. is like, oh, no problem. That's fine. Um, but it's, it's just such, such a gift. It's, it's been extraordinary. It's such great news. And I just want to finish off this part by, by um, just referring to what I heard on, the, on the, your radio interview about the fact that you are seeing Coco again now, which was so yes. glorious to hear. Yes, yeah, so um, Coco um, came, came back into foster care after she was reunified with her mother and um, Eric and I went to go get her because we thought, of course, they'll give her to us. And they didn't, they placed her with a stranger family, which is um, yet another devastating turn in this story, but you can read about that. Um, and we've been fighting for her. We're fighting to bring her home. We want her to live with us and to be with us. Um, but just now we are now Zooming with Coco every Thursday morning. So in a few hours, I'll be Zooming with her. And I, I put on in my other talk that I did this, this evening, I put on some of the weird hats that we wear on Zoom. So I'm a <laughs> jellyfish, right? We're, we're Zooming with a two and a half year old. Um, and we, we've sent her toys that we have. So we do kind of parallel play and we get to see her for 30 minutes every week. And She's giggly and healthy and delightful and mm -hmm. her language is developing and it's the most beautiful joy filled time for 30 minutes and then the screen goes dark and you know it's like losing her all over again every single week so mm -hmm. um, it's a very, very intense um, experience. So much to deal with right now for your family. It's incredible. Okay, I'm going to open up to questions from you now everybody we have a little over 10 minutes left if you want to um what i'm seeing so far is many happy congratulations and thank excitement you and i'm so happy to see all these familiar faces too thank you so much uh for being here so does anyone have any questions because if you don't i can go back to my on my unasked ones but please do write them in the chat um or is it in the q a it's in the chat right leona that's right, isn't it? Yeah, great. Um, so while you're thinking of that, I want to, there's a question back here. I wanted to talk about Eric actually as a, as a kind of narrative force in the book as well. He, like I, I mentioned before that he's, um, he was this sort of strategic um, voice of reason the whole time, even though he was deeply, it's not like he had any um, distance from the emotional trauma of the whole situation and the love and the joy. Um, 
but he he is the one who kind of or, or or in the book anyway you present him as as often calling you out on um you know things that you think or say so there's a point um when Evelyn is freaking out about something you've said and and you say to Eric I can't believe she thinks we want to steal her child and Eric looks at you and said but we do want to steal her child Mm -hmm. so it's this kind of truth-telling voice that is really you know I'm I'm as a reader going I don't want you to say that Eric even Mm -hmm. though I know it is true so can you talk about that about his role in in that sort of way narratively um, well, I'm married to the most fiercely, uh, the person with the most integrity I've ever met. I mean, he has deep integrity. And, and in fact, I think he, uh, we've talked about that. He values integrity over relationship. You know, I remember when we first started dating, uh, he went away on a trip and I was like, I'll miss you. And he said, I don't know if I'll miss you. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> thanks. You know, but, but. But what he meant was like, uh, I don't want to say something that's not true. And and what a gift to be married to someone yeah. like that. I know that he keeps his word. I know that he never says something to try to make me feel better. He's always telling me the truth. And it was like a, he was my anchor and, or, or to mix metaphors, like a lighthouse in this really, really difficult um, time. I also got to witness him becoming a father. He had been resistant. He didn't think mm-hmm. that that was something he wanted to do. He didn't have the desire to do that. And I watched him fall madly in love with Coco. I watched him fall into deep grief and despair. And I watched him be able to say, I, I want to be a father. I want to be a father. This is, I, this is something I want to do. So um, when, when I was going through this, I was talking with a friend of mine who lost a child, whose child died. And I was asking her for help. Um, when we were in the middle of this hellscape and she said tend your marriage Um, Mm -hmm. and Eric and I worked really hard on that you know to to allow our grief to bring us closer together instead of um, driving us apart and and we did which has been uh, such a such a gift and a, Mm -hmm. a balm well he's an amazing person clearly um as you are of course uh we have a question from Natalie. I wonder whether there were questions that you asked yourself or wanted to write through to find the answers while writing the book, but you still don't have answers to now. What is still puzzling you after writing the book? Great question, Natalie. Thanks, and Natalie. And I saw another question from um, Carolyn also who asked if Evelyn had read the book. Uh, oh, sorry, Carolyn. Um, she has not. It was interesting because right, I was about to tell her about the book in November of 2020, um, and she uh, disappeared. Uh, so, and I, I couldn't find her for months, and we couldn't find Coco for months. So, she does not know about the book, um, and uh, I'm uncomfortable with that. But that's the facts, <laughs> and I, I wrote about her in a generous and loving way. So I think if she did read it, she would hopefully experience it as, as a loving, um, as a loving testament to her efforts. I think my questions, let's see this, Natalie, um, the questions that I had was what, what makes a mother? Um, how would, how would we live in this world if we believed we were all related to one another? You know, I have this deep belief that we all come from the stars and so we're all made of the same material. So we're never far from home. Um, we're at home. We all belong to one another. Um, but the real question I have, and that is a live one to me is, are, are we, will we take care of one another? You know, and I think the question of the pandemic is the same question of the foster care system. Will we take care of the most vulnerable? Um, And in the United States, the answer to that, I think, is no, we we do not take care of the most vulnerable. Um, But what's beautiful about the foster care system is that it gives you an opportunity to actually get a phone call where someone needs help and you can say, yes, I will. I will tend this child. Um, So I think that's that's my question is what will it take for us to live as if we're all related and how might we better care for the most vulnerable among us? Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's a lot though in that question, you know, when, when you get the call and say, can you help this person and you have a chance to help that person, quite often you have to say, no, I will not help that person. I can't. Mm-hmm. 
do that to myself. I mean, and that's that's you know, before Coco, there were there were times you did say no to children, and you know, again, it's one of the things that makes the book so interesting is this kind of collision of your the values we think we have, and then when we're asked to act on those values, and this is not a judgment on on anything in the book. Of course, it's about reflecting mm -hmm. all of us and those decisions about if I help now what will it hurt mm -hmm. we, we got I remember we got a, um, a phone call that has stayed with me and it was a radical shattering am I frozen no um, that was no. a radical shattering yeah, for me we got a call for um, a little a little boy who was in our town um, and was, um, it turned out he was three years old and he couldn't talk and he couldn't walk and he had been radically neglected. And um, we thought at first he was one and, and we said yes, and then realized we were not equipped um, to meet his needs and said no. And the amount of shame and shattering that I felt, because I here I am, I've been writing about the fact that we are, we need to respond to other people's suffering. You know, I've been writing about photography theory and ethics of, of violence and how we take care of one another. And, and I said no to a little boy who lived you know, three miles from my house. Um, and it, it, I was like rolled. I was, it really messed me up. Like, who am I? I'm not who I thought I, I was. Um, what does this mean that I said no? And this was another place that Eric and my worldview was different because Eric said, we're saying no all the time. All of us are saying no all the time to people in pain. But I was like, well, but we got a phone call, someone who asked me by name to do something. And I, I said no. Um, but it turned out he got a much better placement than we would have been. He was with he's with the perfect person. He's with a professional occupational therapist and physical therapist who's taking who who knew him before and um, who's taking much better care of him than we could have. And so I think it's important to know your limits and to admit them and to not pretend that. Um, you're always the best answer to everyone's problems. Well, that's like, right, because we we also have a kind of savior complex, some of us, about, you know, if I don't do this, who will? It turns mm -hmm. out actually quite a lot of people. Quite a lot of people and someone better than you, actually. You know, it turns <laughs> out someone more equipped. Um, so, but that, it was a, that was a real challenge for me um, to acknowledge my limits and to... Um, but I want—I wanted to show that on the page. I didn't want this to be like, "Oh, look at me! Look at all this good stuff I did." I wanted to be like, "Look at these are the ways that I really miss miss the mark a lot of times." Um, well, Sarah, that's one of the. I mean, I think the the real. I mean, it's it's a really incredibly moving story, and and you know, everybody from Cheryl Strayed to Sally Field to to everybody. It talks about how moving it is, but also I think it's such a powerful work of self-examination and self-questioning. And that's mm -hmm. why I love your writing so much. And I think you should be really, really proud of this book and all your books, but this is Thank you. obviously so personal. Um, and it made me question myself um, about, you know, my stated beliefs and my lived behavior in all kinds of ways. And that's, I think what the best literature does. I think we can wrap it up. Um, my internet's getting a bit wobbly, so I'm glad that we just lasted the distance. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming along. Leona, I don't know if you want to say anything. Yeah, Should I just we just wanted to give Sarah a round of applause? Definitely. Thank you so much, both of you. It was such a wonderful conversation. Um, it's a beautiful book. It's right here at Better Read Than Dead. You must read it. Like, please come around if you can. Um, I think it's a it's a really important and it's a really beautifully written story. So, congratulations on the book and and thank you everyone for tonight, especially Charlotte and Sarah. Yes, uh, thank you so much for Thanks having me everybody. here and thank you Charlotte for taking time from your writing to do this. I know that. Um, I encourage you to protect your boundaries around your writing, but I'm glad you broke them <laughs> for me. Um, <laughs> I will always break them for you. Uh, thank you to all the people who are here. I love seeing your faces and um, thank you for your questions. This has been a real gift, even at four in the morning. So thank you so much. All right. Let's just yeah. Well, up. you can go back to bed right now. <laughs> if I have to take the baby. Yeah. Bye, right, everybody. Everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.